Well, good evening. Good to see a few uh, popping on here, and I'm going to sing one and uh, and then uh, get right into the message. Um, it's uh, a little chilly here in the land of Goshen, um, and I'm not talking Goshen, Egypt either, or Goshen, Indiana. I'm talking Goshen, Ohio. Um, it is the middle of May, and uh, I've got a jacket on. Um, this should not this should not be happening. Um, I am, uh, uh, I am ready for warmer weather, but along with the warmer weather, I think is going to come, uh, a little bit of rain later on this week, but that's okay. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll suffer through the rain. Uh, it'll be warmer here before too long, and then we'll be complaining because it's too hot, and we'll want to be wearing our jackets, and we won't want it to be quite as cold, or quite as warm, and... We'll want it to be more like fall again and wearing sweatshirts and everything else. But but uh, anyways, um, it is good to see everybody tonight. And I, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna sing one real quick uh, and then uh, get into our uh, our message tonight. Hello, Miss uh, Angel see a comment on there. I'm glad you're visiting with us tonight through Facebook. Um, it says she was a member there years and years and years ago. So, um, but um, good to have you with us tonight. And, um, a little bit of an update. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting stuff going on at uh, church right now. Uh, we have finished the front wall as far as uh, getting the drywall done. And we are working on the subfloor uh, inside of the baptistry now. Uh, we're building that floor up a little bit. Going to do a little something different with the tank uh, in there. As the old tank is was beginning to rust and starting to leak. And so we're starting to, uh, we were uh, at the point of we had to do something or come in and we're wind up being five six hundred gallons of water all through the auditorium and i really didn't want to clean that up and i know you didn't either and so uh, while we're at it we're doing a little bit of uh, a little bit of patchwork a little bit of uh, remodel work kind of reconfiguring some things uh, but the uh, first coats of paint went on the auditorium as far as the walls go uh, painter's been up there working the past few days uh, and uh, he has got he has uh, he has come along pretty far in just the auditorium alone the past couple of days so here probably within the next couple days the auditorium will be done the whole building won't be done painting but the auditorium will be mostly completed as far as painting goes and so uh, Lord willing probably not this Sunday but maybe I'm praying about it but maybe next Sunday we'll be able to have a service inside the auditorium and I'll give you some more updates uh, on that. And uh, uh, Miss Angel, I see, you said you got baptized in that tank. Um, that tank has been there a long time. Uh, I was baptized in that tank. I grew up in that church, and uh, the Lord has seen fit to uh, place me as pastor of the church now. And, and uh, what a blessing it's been. And that tank has been there for a long, long time and has... Uh, many people have seen the inside of that baptistry. Thank the Lord for that. Uh, but uh, anyways, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and sing one real quick. Hello, Sarah. Good to see you pop on. Hope you're doing well. But anyways, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing one here real quick and then get into the message. And hopefully, I am outside, as you can tell, and uh, hopefully I won't uh, get uh, rained on. Hopefully. I am thankful for all you've given me, and I'm asking for your help, Lord, be all you'd have me be. With a humble heart I cry out from a world filled with pain, please help me see the sunshine, look beyond the I'm asking you, cause you know how, to heal the heart and clear the doubt. You can 
take away the hurt Make it all work out I'm asking you Side and you're playing guitar and the wind's blowing and it's a little bit colder your hands stiffen up makes it hard to get some of those chords but uh, anyways it's uh that's a good song I, 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 I love that song I'm gonna maybe try one more here if I can do it I haven't sang this one in a long while uh, but it's a it's an older song Brother Buster Kenzie, one of my favorite preachers, if he pulls this up and listens to it. Um, Brother Buster Kenzie is, is a, a man that I've always admired, and he's always been a great encouragement to me. And uh, I love the way he sings this song. It's called Unseen Hand. So I'm going to try and do it, and uh, but I haven't done it in a long while. So There is an Unseen hand 
I'm gonna drop that down over there a little bit. I want to say hello to all those that have uh, that have popped on here in the last minute or so, and, and uh, glad to uh, see you all. And uh, go with me, if you will, back again tonight to uh, Matthew chapter number 22. Matthew chapter number 22. Um, we've been over the past few weeks. I'm going to reposition the chair. I got a glare on my on my notes. <laughs> Uh, but we've been looking over the past few week, or over the past few weeks, few Wednesday nights, on uh, this um, this thought of entrapment and how there was a time uh, uh, when uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and and the Herodians come to Christ, and this was only uh, only days, only weeks before he was crucified on the cross of Calvary, um, and uh, we're uh, uh, we've been looking at. Uh, the questions that was uh, that was uh, given to Christ. We've been looking at the, uh, I guess you could say, the entrapment that they tried to catch him in. Uh, they tried to ask him some questions that would stumble him up. They figure, well, these are questions that we argue about. These are questions that uh, we don't have a good answer for. So if we don't have a good answer for him, this man named Jesus is not going to have a good answer for him. And so we've uh, we've looked at a political question that the Herodians asked Christ. And we've also looked at a doctrinal question that the Sadducees uh, asked Christ. And tonight I want to look at this last group called the Pharisees. And I want to look at this, uh, this ethical question that now they're asking our Savior. And so verse number 36 of Matthew chapter number 22 says, Master, which is the great commandment? In the law, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord with thy God, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, on, the, on these two command, commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David, he, say, he saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call upon the Lord, saying, The Lord said uh, unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make, thee, make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him him any more questions. I'm going to pray real quick, and then I'm going to get right into uh, the message tonight. So, Heavenly Father, as we come to your throne of grace, we thank you for the day you've given us. And Lord, I do pray that you would just, uh, Lord, help us as we get into your word. Lord, help us to get some answers uh, to maybe some questions that we have in our own life. And Lord, help us to get some understanding from your word tonight. We thank you for everything you've done for us, all the many blessings you've given us. And Lord, I, again, I do never want to take for granted the opportunity that we have, uh, Lord, even though in a little bit of a unique manner, uh, but through Facebook, we still have a way that we're able to meet. And Lord, here very soon, Lord, I pray that we'd be able to meet back within our building and be able to be together once again, Lord, serving you, worshiping you, gathering around your word, singing songs of praise. Lord, and enjoying each other's fellowship, but most of all, or being able to enjoy serving you and thanking you for what you've done. We love you. We thank you. Go with us now, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So like I said, we've been, over the past couple of weeks, been looking at these questions and this ethical question that the Pharisees come. At this point, uh, uh, this is a point of contention in these days between the Pharisees and the scribes about which commandments were the heaviest or uh, I guess you could say the weightiest. Uh, this is something that they, they argued about. This is something that they continually fought over. They found 613 commandments in their Old Testament. They found, uh, they, they found those 600 and they, they divided them into two categories and that was either both, it was either heavy or light. So, and, and they, they divided them into those categories, and still today, some practice what is called Christianity light. 
and, and so uh, as if God is is more serious about some of his commands than, than others uh, that really maybe don't matter quite as much. It, this is this is an argument that they that they continually fought over and even today this is this is an argument that people get into well did god really mean that when he said this or is that really as bad as that well that's just a little lie or that's just a little sin or that's just a little this or a little that it, it doesn't matter sin is sin and we'll get into that here in just a little while uh but uh, this goes to show just how much uh, just how you can be religious and still be I guess you could say devoid of spiritual understanding. Well, we can go to church. We can uh, we can sit on the pew Sunday after Sunday. We can uh, we can go to Bible study Wednesday night after Wednesday night, and 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 we can uh, we can uh, we we can do all the religious practices, and still know nothing about God's word. Still know nothing about what God has for us. Uh, there's there's three fallacies about this approach of uh, of the weightiest or the heaviest versus the light, the ones that don't mean quite as as much as some people would say. Number one, they they reduced uh, they reduced a relationship with God. It reduced that fact of needing that personal relationship to keep a uh, to uh, to uh, keeping a a list of rules. I guess you could say. Uh, but uh, it's it's so much more than that. Religion starts on the outside and tries to work its way in, but Christianity is within and is real. And as that Christianity grows, as that relationship with Christ grows, as that uh, as that uh, that fellowship and that one on one, that intimate relationship that we have with God grows, it begins to show from the inside out. It begins to people around us start to see some things uh, that's going on within you. You can be inhabited by rules. I, I heard a preacher say it this way: You can be inhabited by rules uh, if you want to, but I'd rather be inhabited by the rule maker. I I'm, I can memorize my Bible cover to cover. You you could you could memorize your Bible cover to cover. You could memorize chapters of the Bible. You can, uh, you can know everything there is to know doctrinally, but that doesn't make you saved. You can know the author, uh, or you, you can know the book itself, but until you know the author of the book, until you know Christ himself, until you know the rule maker, something's missing. Uh, who can, uh, who, uh, who, who then helps me to obey them once I'm, once I'm inhabited by Christ, once I'm saved, and once I invite him into my heart as Savior, he's the one who helps me to obey them because I want to. These commands that he's left us with in Scripture, it's not a, we, we ought not to feel pressured to obey the, the commands or the ordinances that God has left us here with. It, it's not, it, it shouldn't be a a fearful to say, well, I'm afraid of if I mess up, then then I'm going to go to hell, or I'm, I'm afraid that if I mess up, God's going to strike me dead. Look, it's not something that we should be fearful of. It is a, we want to follow Christ as close as possible because we love him, because of what he did for us, dying on the cross for our sins. It's not a, well, this command is heavier or more weighty than, than, than something else. It's, I want to do, I want to follow Christ Christ's words as closely as possible because I want to, because I love him, because of what he did for me. And so there's, uh, that's just one of the fallacies. The second is that there's no such thing as a weightier commandment. There, there, there's, no, there's no such thing as a commandment that is greater than another. If God says anything, then it's important. If it comes out of God's mouth, if it is if it is in this book right here, it's important, and we ought to be listening to it. We ought to be paying attention to it. We ought to be abiding by His law, His word. God's word is is the ought to be the final authority in our life. We call some sins little white lies or or minor infractions. I guess you could say it that way. But God sees all sins the same. 
It doesn't matter what it is. He sees everything exactly the same. We we say someone that uh, we say someone has fallen into deep sin, and everyone automatically assumes that it's either maybe drunkenness or or or, or adultery or uh, or something of the like. But but God looks at someone who maybe be listening tonight who has maybe stopped tithing or says you've fallen into deep sin or uh, they argue with their spouse or even though everyone even though we all do that god sees sees it just as seriously as if i was to beat up my wife Sin is sin, folks. It doesn't matter. And that's where the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the Herodians, that's where they just, they didn't understand as well. We think this one ought to be a little heavier than than, than this one here. Well, this one, there's a little slack here and there. No, if, if God says it's sin, if we go against God's word, if we go against God's law, if we go against God, what God has to say, then guess what? It doesn't matter how big or little it ranks on our scale. If God says it's sin, it's sin. It's all the same. And so, thirdly, the third fallacy is they thought they could get to heaven by keeping the law. That's what that, that's what their belief system was. They they thought they could get to heaven just by keeping the law, but we know we know none can live good enough. There's none good, no, not one. Scripture even tells us that. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. Scripture tells us that. It's not what I can do. I, I can't do anything that will get me through the gates of heaven other than accepting Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, believing that he died on the cross for my sins and for your sins, but knowing what he has done for us. It's important for us to know that it's not in me. The law was just a a teacher. I heard, a, and I don't remember the, the fellow's name that said this, but I heard a man say, uh, that the law was just a teacher to show us our sinfulness and hopeless state unless we look to the cross. And I like the way he I like the way he worded that. I like the way he used that because today in today's society in today's world and honestly in churches today we we believe that or there's a lot of churches that believe that the Old Testament is just irrelevant to us. We live in the New Testament age. We're uh, we're uh, we, we're uh, we're not under the law anymore. While no, we are not under the law anymore. When Christ died on the cross for your sins and for mine, when He shed His blood, no, we're not under the law, so to say, as we have to live by the law in order to be good with God. But uh, but that law is a teacher. It shows us those things in our life. It shows us those those imperfections. And Scripture even uses the refiner's fire of how God takes that fire and he he melts us down and he begins to peel back the layers and he he begins to get all the dross out of our lives, all the imperfections out of our lives. The only way that's going to happen is number 1 if we spend time with God, if we build upon that 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 intimate relationship with God and if we allow him to take his word as the refiner's fire uh, both the law in the new, in the Old Testament and the words of the New Testament, and we allow Him to take those things and mold us and make us and reshape us into something that looks more like Him. So everything in this Bible, everything in His Word, points us directly to the cross. Everything. So the question. Uh, this question about the law and which commandments are, are the most serious was was really a controversial one back then and today. It was something that they questioned. There, there should uh, they, they thought well there there should be no answer to it. They, or they thought and I guess you could say that they caught on slow because Christ had already given an answer to the Herodians and to the Sadducees. He had, he had, he had already floored them with his doctrine. He had already floored them with his answers that he gave the Herodians. And so you, you think, you know, the Sadducees, you'd think they'd catch on. Well, maybe, we, maybe we're not going to get anything over on this guy. Maybe we're not going to get anything over on this man named Jesus. 
They were slow learners. But in verse 37, we see where Christ begins to answer their question of which is the great commandment. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. He gives them this answer. And then he says, in verse 38, sorry, wind's blowing my, uh, blowing my pages here a little bit. He says, this is the first and great command, commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So all 613 commandments boil down to one word, love. Everything that was in the Old Testament, everything that they that the Pharisees were placing their belief in, all revolves around love for God and for people. For God so, what's that next word? Loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because of the love that God showed us, we have salvation because of that love that he gave to us on the cross of Calvary and shedding his blood, we have escaped of that awful place called hell. It, it, it reveals the heart behind our actions, love does, the, the, the right motive for right living. If, if the Christian life were a door you could walk through, then the hinges, then the hinges of that door I, swings on, I guess you could call love for God and love for others. I heard, uh, I had a conversation, this has been um, months back, honestly, I had, had a conversation with a, with a preacher at a, at a meeting, uh, and um, yeah, I've always heard people say, I've always heard evangelists, I've always heard, and it's in a joking manner of, well, ministry would be great if it weren't for people. That statement didn't make any sense to me because ministry is people. If you don't have a love for people, then why are you in ministry? If you don't have a, if you don't have a love for people, then obviously you don't have a love for God. You have to have love for God. Now I know I, I know that that statement is meant in a funny manner, but I don't know, my mind just got to reeling on what the question or, 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 or what, the, what the statement was actually about. And I honestly got convicted about it a little bit because, yeah, guess what? We are people, we are human, we're flesh and blood, and guess what we do? We get on each other's nerves <laughs> a lot. We, we aggravate each other. We, we, we consistently go at each other. But, folks... We ought to have such a love for people that we share what God has done for us on the cross of Calvary. We ought to share God's love with others. Yeah, you know, my kids and I'm sure your kids can can do wrong in a number of different ways, but always it always boils down to uh, to a lack of of love for someone or something or. Uh, whether God or mom or, or a friend or, 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 or someone else. But our disobedience, our, uh, our, uh, our lack of understanding, uh, I shouldn't say lack of understanding, our, our, our lack of sincerity all boils down to our lack of love. When you love to do something, you put everything you have into it, right? God loved you so much, he put everything he had, everything, his entire life, his, his, his blood he shed on the cross of Calvary. Why? Because he loved you that much. You put everything you have into it when you love something. I love music. love to play guitar. My wife makes fun of me all the time. I, I, won't, I won't say makes fun of me. She's sitting in the, in the house, uh, probably staring at me through the window. Um, but... Um, Anyways, she, she laughs at me all the time because I can't do two things at once. But when I, when I play guitar, it's like I channel everything else out. 
You can you can hold an entire conversation with me if you want, but I am not going to answer you. I just I can't do it. Uh, I get in, involved into my music and I put everything. I shut everything else out, and I put everything that I am into that into that piece of music that I'm playing. I put everything that I do into that piece of music. And when I'm playing with my kids, guess what I do? I, I over exaggerate. I, I get hyper. I get. Uh, I I go berserk. Why? Of course, my kids love it. My kids love it when Daddy gets down the floor with them and rolls around, and I pick them up and sling them around and wrestle with them, and they love it. I'll put everything I have into that. Why? Because I love them. What about when I'm with God? What about when I'm at church? What about when I'm not at church? What, what about when I'm anywhere and everywhere else in my life? I ought to be putting everything I am into my relationship with God. Why? Because he loved me and I love him. That ought to be what we ought to do. Many people ask uh, uh, ask pastors a lot of different questions about, uh, uh, about um, what I heard uh, uh, one preacher describe it as, uh, as uh, peripheral issues, things on the side. Uh, questions like, well, what about this type of music or what about this type of clothing? What about this movie or this store or this product? But what, what, what they all boil down to is the same root question of how much, how much do you love God? And let me explain that. Once you decide if, you, if God is number one in your life, you find many of those other questions that we begin to ask tend to answer themselves. Well, this music just doesn't seem to line up or... or is this music okay, or, or is uh, is what I've got on okay, or uh, the way I do my hair, or the way I do my makeup, the glasses on my face, the rings on my fingers, the style guitar that I play, the style car that I that I drive. We, unfortunately, as churches, unfortunately as Christians, much like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the Herodians, we have focused throughout the years on the wrong questions. We have focused throughout the years on the wrong, uh, on answering all the wrong questions. Because if we answer the number one question, and that is, do I love God or do I not? Do I know Christ as my Savior or do I not? If we would answer that question, the rest of those questions would answer themselves. Why? Because when we start building our relationship on God, when we would start building our lives upon God, our lives start to develop more into a godly lifestyle. If we're allowing ourselves to get into this word, into God's word, and allowing him to make the changes, allowing him to answer our questions. Somebody at, at church comes and asks me a question. You know where I'm going to go? Not to Webster's Dictionary. Not to Google. <laughs> If I'm going to give somebody an answer to a question, to a biblical question, guess what? I'm going to have to go to the Bible. If, if somebody comes to me, well, what about this in your church? Or, or what does the Bible say about this? Or what's your belief on this? See, I could put my opinion in it all day long. You could put your opinion in it all day long. But here's the problem. That's exactly what it is, is your opinion. What's God's word have to say about it? We need to find ourselves fixed on God as being number one in our life. He's that hub in the center of the wheel and everything else just tends to flow around it as spokes. But everything in our life, everything that goes around our wheel ought to come right back to God. Well, I get to do this, which gets me closer to God. Well, I get to do this, which eventually brings me back to God. Everything ought to, everything ought to focus on God being number one. John Maxwell put out a thing, and it was called Ten Commandments for Falling in Love with God. And I thought it was really good. And right now, we've got a lot of time on our hands in order to, uh, in order to really develop our relationship with God. And I hope that you've been doing that 
uh, during this time. I, I know things are frustrating. I know, guess what, Friday, Friday, barbershops and salons start to open back up. And guess what? I'm probably going to go get a haircut because I'm going to need one. I, uh, their uh, department stores are opening back up. They, uh, our lives are going to begin, hopefully, to get back to somewhat of normality. Thankfully, no matter how abnormal this world may be, no matter how normal everything else might get to be or might not get to be, we can focus on God. And so I just want to read a few of these off and mention them really quickly. I, John Maxwell, I don't agree with everything he says, but there's a lot in here that I thought was pretty good. Number one, take personal responsibility for being intimate with God. Our, I think our society is ashamed a little bit of that word intimate. They're afraid of that word intimate, I guess you could say. You know, uh, <laughs> a, a wife complained as, as her husband drove down the road and she says, well, Honey, we aren't as close as we used to be. Oh, we used to sit right beside each other, and and now we're so distant. And the husband, the husband's reply to her is, "Well, who moved? He's still driving the car. She had to move." You know, the ball is in our court when it comes to our relationship with God. The ball is in our court. If if you aren't as close to God as you maybe used to be, guess who moved? It wasn't him. You are to initiate it. He already has made the first move. He died on the cross of Calvary because he loved you, because he wants a relationship with you, because he wants that fellowship back with you. He died on the cross. Now you draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. He made the first move. Now it's our turn. Uh, someone asked me uh, a long while back about the term backslidden or backslide. What, do, well, what does it mean? What, 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 does, uh, what, what does being backslidden really mean? If you've ever been closer to God than you are right now, then you are backslidden. If there was a time in your life, say right after you got saved, where your relationship with God was extremely good, <laughs> where everything just seemed like everything was just flowing together and you had this walk with God that you really just couldn't explain and now as time has gone on and uh, and we've just gotten busy with so many other things that God's kind of taken that left burner or maybe even maybe even kind of taken the back seat or you've placed him somewhere else if you are if you have ever been closer to God at some point in your life than you are now you fall under the category of backslidden. And let, folks, let me tell you, we have all, and I said we, including myself, we have all been there. But you have a choice and I have a choice to continue and to bring that relationship back into fellowship, bring that relationship back close to God. Number two, spend time with God. It's impossible to be intimate with anyone if, if you don't spend time together. Folks, right now, as far as husband and wives go, we have had so much time together. And then there again, people can be in the same house and not spend time with each other at all. People can be in the same house and never say two words to each other. That's crazy to me. But it happens, folks, it happens in my house. It's not that we don't want to talk. It's not that we, it's, I'm busy doing this and she's busy doing that and the kids are doing this. And it, it's, it's hard and at times very easy to not be close to one another and yet be close to each other. So if all you get from God's word this week is what we're studying right now, folks, I'm going to tell you you're in trouble. If all you get from God's word is what you get on a Sunday morning or what you get on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night or maybe by happenstance you just come across another preacher on, 
on Facebook or you come across another church service on YouTube and you think, well, I'll listen to this. If that's all you get from week to week is just the simple Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, maybe a Bible study here or there. If that's all you get, folks, we are in trouble. Don't drive to God once a week. Have a walk with God. Don't drive on Sunday mornings, go to church and say, well, I'm at church. Praise God. Well, I'm glad you're there. I'm glad you're going to church. I'm glad you're listening on uh, on social media. I'm glad that you're I'm glad that you're being active in Bible study. That's great. But if all you get week to week is just those couple of services here or there, folks, you're in trouble. If all I get is if all I get is a little bit here and there, folks, there's no way we can develop a relationship and walk with God and spend time with God like we ought to if we're never in his word. Have daily devotionals. We have uh, we have at church, we have our Call to Glory books. I love them. I love them. I don't always finish them month to month. Uh, a lot of times I'll, uh, sometimes I don't finish every page in them. I jump from here to there, but I, you know, I'm trying to study for three services a week and sometimes more depending on what's going on. And sometimes my Bible study for preaching kind of overlaps into my Bible study for my daily devotionals. And a lot of times my daily devotionals wind up being a message that I preach at church. It's funny how God does those things. Not all of us are morning people. I've always been the type of person that once my eyes open, I can move pretty well. I can get up and I can get started and I'm ready to go. I get cleaned up pretty quick. I can get dressed pretty quick. And I can be hitting the ground running. My wife is not that way. It takes her a minute. <laughs> it takes her it takes her a few minutes to get up and get moving and get her a cup of coffee or or or, or a cup of hot tea or whatever it is she's going to drink that morning and then she starts into her routine. Kenna, she's like me. When she's awake, she's awake. Jericho, he's like his mama. He looks like me, but he's a lot like his mama. He you go wake him up, it takes he takes his time and he slowly starts to get moving and then once he's moving he's good. Malachi, he's kind of in between. Takes him a second to get a, to get up and get awake, but once he's awake, woo, it is full throttle all day long once he's awake. But spend time with God whenever you can. Make the time even, you know, and make it even better. Carry that attitude of commune with God all along, all along through the day. Be thinking about what you've studied. Be thinking about what you've read. Number three, avoid things that dull your spiritual sensitivity. Susan Wesley said this. She said, anything that dulls our desire for God, to us it is sin. I like that statement. Just, just like looking through a dirty window, it kind of it kind of hinders our vision. Uh, if you ask my wife, I hate things to be on the windshield of the car. If there's a spot on the windshield of the car, guess what? My eyes automatically go to that, that spot on the windshield. I just follow it. I, my glasses, if my glasses have dirt or dust on them, I got to take them off. I got to clean them. I can't have anything uh, hindering my vision because my eyes will just follow and then I wind up getting a headache and then, then it ain't good. Then it's rough the rest of the day. But we ought to make sure that our, our vision is clear. Cares, cares of this world will, will cloud our eyesight for God. You know, one of the best things for us uh, for us to have is less, then we'll hear more from God when he's not competing with so much else. And I guess I, I guess I can say that's why I like to keep a certain flow in, a, in our services when we're in the building. Uh, we have an order of service that we try to kind of, we, we, I try not to stick to it so close that God can't move. Yeah, we have an order of service. We want to keep everything in a flow. We want to we want to keep everything flowing where we can focus on God. 
We don't have to have all the lights. We don't have to have all the big shows. We don't have to we we don't have to dress things up to make it some huge production, folks. We can just go in and worship God, whether in song or whether in preaching or whether in testimony or whether in prayer time. Simplify things and just allow God to speak so that we can listen. Number four, seek to please God. I'm going to try and rush through these a little bit. But seek to please God. Remember, uh, remember when you were maybe dating, how you would do things that would please, whether it's your girlfriend or boyfriend. I remember when Lindsay and I started dating, I wanted to do anything I could to please her. I wanted to buy her little things, take her out to dinner, do, do little things here and there, and I still do that. Guys, never stop dating your wife. Never stop dating your wife. Yes, I know you're married. Yes, I know you, some of you have probably been married for 20, 30, even 40 plus years. That's okay. You can still date your wife. You can still do things for her. Take her out to dinner. But by showing your wife or doing those things, seeking to please your wife or your, your girlfriend or your, uh, 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 or your boyfriend, ladies, you're, you're putting that person first, seeking to please them. We ought to want to please God. But now... Selfishness has kind of crept in. You know, it's okay to look out for number one as long as God stays that in that number one slot. My life ought to honor God. God ought to be the number one. Everything I do ought to be to honor God. And so, if my life is honoring God and and I'm trying to please God, then that'll start overflowing into everything else in my life. Number five, reflect on what God's doing in your life. Uh, you know, this is a it's a it's a higher perspe perspective, not not muddied by the here and now. It's stopping and seeing the big picture. We we take things for granted, don't we? You know, I I, I realize that uh, that we we like to take the normal in our life for granted, folks. This has rocked our world as far as normal goes with this virus thing that everybody's concerned about it has rocked our normal but a few weeks ago i believe i even preached a message about paying attention to the things that god's doing right now where i made that statement in a message we can look around and god's doing so much spend time with uh, with with christians who model love for god we become like those we spend time with. Spend a little bit more time here. And being Christian needs to be Christ-like. We spend a little bit more time with God, and in His Word, we're going to look more like a Christian. They were called Christians first at Antioch. Why? Because they spent so much time with God that they began to look like Christ. They began to look like a Christian. Number seven, Participate in things that encourage love for God and love for others. Uh, Sunday school. Uh, maybe men's prayer breakfast. We've had a few of those. Ladies Bible studies. Ladies meeting. Get involved in those things. I want to encourage you as soon as we're able to get back to doing those things, which hopefully this summer uh, we will. We'll be able to do some men's outings. We'll be able to do some ladies Bible studies. Ladies uh, ladies retreats maybe or um, but beyond that get involved in those things where you're gathered around fellow Christians that those that are uh, those that uh, uh, those that love God and promote that encourage that and and you can kind of I guess you could say iron sharpens iron you know, when we're in fellowship hand in hand we, we, we form a stronger chain I guess you could say Practice love in the home. Some, uh, some can say I love you and some can say it but don't show it. I want my kids to know that I love them. I want my wife to know that I love them. And it's, you know, it doesn't take a something huge to show that you love somebody. It, the little things, the little thoughts. 
Number nine, always ask, what would Jesus do in every situation? In situations that we that we encounter, we ought to develop a uh, this this conscience of realizing that number one, God's in control, but He's He's there with us in every choice that we make, or at least He should be. He should be the one that we consult. Uh, we, uh, my brother-in-law and I, um, had joked about uh, <laughs> getting some T-shirts made. And uh, for those that know my grandpa, Brother Junior Pittman, um, we, we had laughed about getting some T-shirts made and across the front of them, uh, what would Junior Pittman do? Uh, <laughs> and uh, at some point in time, those might become a reality. Uh, yes, it is a joke, but well, uh, we both look, uh, look up to Brother Pittman. And so uh, we... Uh, we hold his opinion in high regard. Uh, but anyways, number 10, understand real success in God's eyes. Real success is not found in doing, but in being. And I didn't, uh, I didn't originate that. But um, why don't we spend real time with God? Two reasons. We're either too lazy or we're easy, or we're either too busy. Why don't we spend more time with God? Because we're either too lazy or too busy. Well, I don't really feel like reading right now. Or well, I've really got I've got more to do than just sit here and read. Or I've got more to do than just sit here and pray. Or I got more to do than just than go to church. Or more to do than just simply have a little fellowship with God. There was a bumper sticker that that reads like this: "The one who." dies with the most toys, wins. <laughs> but that's not true at all. That one still dies and stands before God and will have nothing left from this world. If you look with me real quick, and I'll be, I'm about done, Jeremiah chapter number 9. And Jeremiah chapter number 9. In verse 23. 24. Thus saith the, saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the, let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his, in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory, uh, glory in, his, in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord." In verse 39, going back to Matthew chapter number 22, in verse number 39, says this, And the second is likened to, likened to it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You can't be right with God and wrong with people. In First Peter, it indicates that if a man's not right with his wife, that his prayers could be hindered. A very practical way to love God is to love others. Jesus has already answered three tough questions. In verse forty-one, he says, "While the it says while the Pharisees gathered together, Jesus answered them or asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he?" He asked a question to them. Now he's turned the tables. This, uh, uh, in, let me continue to read there. They, they said in verse 42, they say unto him, the son of David, and he say, saith unto them, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my, uh, unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son. The, the question is, how could the Messiah be the son of David and also the Lord of David? Your son can't be your Lord. The, you know, the Pharisees agreed that, that, that the Lord would be 
both, but never understood how until until now, as Jesus pointed out, the, that the Messiah would would have to be from David's lineage and yet would have to somehow be divine. They didn't understand in verse 46, and no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. You see, they, they didn't understand because they they didn't they didn't answer because they, they the only answer that would be that would be that the Messiah's father would have to be God and his mother a human and virgin and they they wouldn't give him <laughs> they wouldn't give him that it was they who were trapped in their own discussion they entrapped themselves by trying to entrap Christ by trying to get him tripped up on his words, they wound up trapped in their own snare. This is the most important question any of, you, any of us can face. Do you believe in Christ as the Son of God or not? Until then, it is we who are trapped in our sin. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you are trapped in your sin. The only question in your life that needs to be answered today, right now, is do you know Christ as your Savior or not? You can. He's offered his blood on the cross of Calvary. He says, come unto me. Do you know Christ as your Savior? Is there someone close to you that maybe you're worried that doesn't know Christ? Maybe we ought to be praying for them, continually reaching out to them sharing what God has done for us. I'm going to pray. I'm going to make a few announcements here real quick. And uh, this will be posted to our Facebook page. Uh, and, and so if you've missed some of it, you can go back and watch it again. Uh, and uh, we'll also try to put it, I think we're a few behind on getting a few onto our Facebook or our YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, you can look that up by One Baptist Goshen on YouTube the number one Baptist Goshen. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to pray and then uh, make a few announcements. Heavenly Fathers, we come to your throne of grace. We thank you for the day you've given us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And I pray that you would just, Lord, help us tonight to answer the most important question. Lord, not uh, not political, not, uh, Lord, not a, not a question that would, uh, that would, that would be uh, ethical, but Lord, help us to, answer this one question of do we know you as our savior do we love you do we want to spend time with you lord help us not to question your authority but lord help us to lean not on our own understanding but lord lean on uh, on you and in your word and lord understanding that there is no greater question than do we know christ as our personal lord and savior or go with us now or lead us guide us protect us and lord may we be able to be back in our building here soon. We love you, we thank you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, I mentioned it a little bit uh, at the beginning. We are making wonderful progress on getting the building painted. Uh, and a big shout out to uh, Napier's Touch uh, Painting, who is painting the interior of the building and uh, has done a wonderful job thus far, moving quickly uh, and... Uh, now that we've got all the patchwork done and uh, there was a lot once we started getting into things I'm glad that we did I'm glad that we uh, started doing some updates and doing some patchwork because if not uh, it, it could get uh, it could have could have been really bad by the time uh, by the time we're able to be back in the building uh, and so it could have got worse if we'd have just let it go. So there's a lot of patchwork that needed to be done on some of the walls, especially where the the uh, firewall on the roof had been leaking. And so we got those all fixed, got the roof sealed up, so it's not leaking anymore. And that's what we wanted to make sure before we started patching a bunch of stuff inside, get everything outside taken care of. So that's done. Um, but uh, we're finishing up uh, uh, some other little projects in the auditorium and then going to... The, Painter's going to start moving through the rest of the building. But as long as he's got the auditorium done here, maybe within the next week or so, we'll be able to have a service within our building. 
and uh, I'll give you I'll be giving you some uh, some more info on that uh, as to what to expect as we start going back into the building we want to do things the right way we don't want to be a hindrance in our community we want to be an encouragement uh, to those around us uh, and do things as as best as we can to make it as safe as we can for those uh, that come in those doors so we love you all we're praying for you and uh, I think I'm going to sing one more song if that's all right with you all I don't think you would care too much scoot back here a little bit so I don't bust my guitar up on the table here This is uh, he uh, loves to hear. So it's called "Where I Where I Make My Home." Some people came to visit me one day from their church up in town. Said they came to share the Lord with the lost, those cast down. They hope. Up the Bible and they read sweetest words I never heard. They read how Jesus came to the poor and the outcast of this earth. So I knelt down on my knees in the dirt and gave Jesus my soul. Never felt such love before, so I thought. To the church I go But there's something wrong I fear for everyone Keeps looking back at me A man from the front Has come to my seat Will he ask me to leave Did they not know I had no better clothes That I could wear no, my shoes are old, my coat is torn, my bum kept hair. I wonder when Jesus looks down from his high and lofty throne. Does it matter these clothes that I wear or where I make my home? smiled and he took my hand and he said we're so glad you came special place we kept for you then he spoke my name saw a tear run down his face and I wondered what God had in store I knew it had to be much better than I'd ever known before They did not care I had no better clothes That I could wear They knew my shoes were old My coat was torn My bum kept hair I'm glad that when Jesus looks down From his high and lofty throne matter these clothes that I wear but where I make my home I'm glad that when Jesus looks down from his high and lofty throne doesn't matter these clothes that I wear but where I make my home All right, y'all. Well, it's good to see you on here tonight and uh, good to fellowship in some capacity. Good to see some hearts flying and some thumbs up and and uh, some hugs going on and just the Facebook arena. Uh, but uh, I'm glad to see you all uh, pop on here tonight. I love you. I miss you. Looking forward to the day where we can be back in the building and looking forward to being able to uh, fellowship one with another. So you all have a good rest of the week.
If you need anything, uh, you can call my cell phone. You can call the church. You can get a hold of me through text message, through Facebook Messenger. You can get a hold of me through the Facebook, the church Facebook. Uh, and so, uh, if for some if for some reason you would need to get a hold of me, uh, I'm always here. I'll, I'll pray for you. I'll pray with you. Uh, I'll help you out in any way I can. So, love you, and we'll, we'll see you later.